Hello and welcome to the webinar on why the concern about nitrous oxide emissions by Craig Cogger of Washington State University Puyallup. This is the first of two webinars this week on the topic of greenhouse gases and reduced tillage in organic farming systems. The second webinar, Management to Reduce N2O Emissions in Organic Vegetable Production Systems, will be presented this Thursday, February 27th. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. This presentation is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recording on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel within the coming week. Today's presentation will last approximately 45 minutes and then we'll have an additional 30 minutes for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, you can type it into the question box and hit return. If you don't see the question box, just click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel and that will open it up. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over and we'll answer as many as we have time for. Later today, we'll also be sending a short evaluation survey by email, and we'd really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to fill that out. We're very pleased to welcome Craig Cogger as our speaker today. Craig is a research and extension soil scientist at the Washington State University Puyallup Research and Extension Center. His current research is focused on organic vegetable farming systems and land application of organic waste in the Pacific Northwest, including nutrient management, soil quality, and food safety. Anne-Marie Fortuna of North Dakota State University and Douglas Collins of WSU will be online with us today as well for the question and answer session, and they will be presenting the second webinar in this series on Thursday. So with that, I'm going to hand over the screen controls to our first speaker, who is Craig Cogger. So Craig, you should now have the screen control, and if you just click on your screen once, it will get it going. Okay, thanks very much, Alice. Um, and, and welcome to this webinar. Um, today, I'm going to be really setting the stage, talking about um, nitrous oxide as, as a greenhouse gas and Muted. it's a gas that we're concerned about, um, looking at, at the role of agriculture in nitrous oxide emissions. We'll look at the nitrogen cycle and see where nitrous oxide production um, comes in that cycle. Um, and then ask the question, why are we, do we want to study nitrous oxide emissions in organic farming systems? I'll then introduce some field experiments that we have that are the context for where we're measuring the nitrous oxide emissions and kind of a little bit of just very briefly about why we chose those treatments in our experiments and then an introduction to our measurements. In the second um, part of the the seminar on, on webinar, excuse me, on Thursday, you will hear um, a, a lot more information about what's going on in those experiments, um, some of the biology that goes on them, and it kind of a little bit of the data that we've collected to date. And with that, I will begin. If we think about greenhouse gases that are affecting climate change, um, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor are the main greenhouse gases. Um, they are all naturally present in the atmosphere and that's a good thing because the levels of these gases in, in the atmosphere um, are at a point where they trap enough heat to make our planet livable. If we had no greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the average temperature for planet Earth would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit and, um, and basically we'd be frozen over and um, there'd be little if any life on Earth but the greenhouse gases um, raise that average temperature by about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, essentially by trapping heat in the atmosphere and, and slowing its loss to space. The problem that we face right now is that humans are increasing um, greenhouse gas emissions through our own activities. This includes carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, so we're trapping more heat in the atmosphere raising the global temperature, changing the climate, and we know or we expect that most of the impacts 
from this change in climate are going to be negative, including a lot of impacts on agriculture. Um, water vapor we call a feedback gas. Its um, concentration in the atmosphere, one is constrained by the temperature of the atmosphere. The warmer the atmosphere, the war more water vapor we can hold. So as our atmosphere warms, we also get a greenhouse effect, an enhanced greenhouse effect from increasing carbon dioxide. If we look at nitrous oxide on this graph, we see that its concentration is much lower than carbon dioxide, um, less, much less than one part per mi million, only about 325 parts per billion. Um, it has a long persistence in the atmosphere, which means that what goes up today is going to stick around for a while, um, on the average of more than a century. And that right-hand column, global warming potential, that tells us how potent um, nitrous oxide is at trapping outgoing radiation, at trapping outgoing heat compared with carbon dioxide. And you can see it's quite a bit more potent. And that's really, interestingly, a function of the fact that it's present at much lower levels. So the absorption bands where it's absorption, absorbing heat is a lot more wide open. So it's a more effective greenhouse gas. Oops, excuse me, I went, went too far there. Okay, if we look at this graph, and this just is kind of a, a brief summary of both kind of modern data and ancient data from ice cores, and it shows that all three of these greenhouse gases um, are increasing in the atmosphere at a rapid rate now due to various human activities. If we look at nitrous oxide emissions compared to the big greenhouse gas picture, and this is <clears throat> measured in what's called carbon dioxide equivalence. So this takes into account both the concentration and the potency of the gas. And this is in the United States. We see nitrous oxide counts for about 5% of those emissions. Um, carbon dioxide is definitely the big one that we need to be concerned about, but nitrous oxide nonetheless plays an important role. If we look at the sources of some of the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, or the human sources, I should say, carbon dioxide is predominantly from fossil fuel emissions. Um, and so that is really the biggest um, piece of the climate change mitigation pie that we have, is reducing our fossil fuel use. And so that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, agriculture and ecosystems do a lot of cycling of carbon dioxide, and that's not the, the topic that I'll be talking about today, but through the carbon cycle, moving from the atmosphere into the biosphere, into the soils, and there is agricultural management that we can do to increase um, the sequestration or the uptake into the soils, which is one way that we can start to mitigate climate change. Um, methane gas, a range of sources. Um, agriculture is one of the major ones. Um, this is both from um, ruminant animals and from rice paddies would be a couple of the major sources there. And then nitrous oxide, the one we're talking about today, the human-induced um, um, emissions are primarily from agriculture. And this pie chart is looking just, just at the United States, but we can see where it says agricultural soil management, and that's basically our, our fertilizer, our fertility management, um, we're seeing the vast bulk of nitrous oxide emissions right there. So that's why that we're focusing from an agricultural point of view, one of our focuses is on nitrous oxide. So if we look at the sources of nitrous oxide emissions from soil, this is a natural part of the nitrogen cycle. Um, these emissions have been around, you know, ha have been around forever. But what we've done through our agricultural development over the last century 
is greatly increased agricultural nitrogen inputs. Um, we have a lot more what we call reactive nitrogen in the system right now and it's that reactive nitrogen that um, that can be sources from our nitrous oxide emissions. And as this slide shows, it's not just commercial fertilizers that um, are part of our increased reactive nitrogen. It's also our um, production and use of animal manures and other organic wastes in agriculture. And it's also through nitrogen fixation um, from legume cover crops where we're adding nitrogen to the system and adding reactive nitrogen to the system. Um, let's take a, a brief look at the nitrogen cycle to see where nitrous oxide comes into play. And sometimes I joke that it's part of my contract to do a nitrogen cycle slide in every talk that I give. And I probably do have this slide in, in just about every talk that I give. But I think it's worthwhile just reviewing this quickly. Um, we see in the upper left-hand part here organic nitrogen. Um, that organic nitrogen is present in soil organic matter. It's present in organic amendments that we add to soils. It's present in plant residues, whether these are cover crops that we, that we grow and then incorporate into the soil or leave on the surface of the soil or other crop residues. And when nitrogen is in an organic form, it is not available to plants. We have to rely on um, <coughs> biological activity in the soil to release that, um, to break down that organic nitrogen. And the first product that's released is ammonium. Ammonium is a simple soluble ion available to plants. There's just a wide suite of microorganisms that can release ammonium from organic matter. They're using the carbon as their energy source. Ammonium is a waste product. Ammonium is then transformed by other microbes into nitrate and these microbes are using the ammonium as, um, as their um, energy source and they produce nitrate which is another simple soluble ion also available to plants. And I think that we're all well aware that the nitrate, um, excuse me, I hear some background noise. I'll be back in a second here just to see what's going on, sorry. Sorry about that. My office isn't quite as soundproofed as I as as I thought it was. Um, anyway, talking about the nitrogen cycle, nitrate subject to leaching in our wetter environments, but we also know that if we have an oxygen deficient environment, that nitrate can be denitrified, denitrification to nitrogen gas. And then the rest of the cycle involving nitrogen fixation, um, we're not going to talk about today. So where does nitrous oxide fit in? There are two places. Probably the best known is in the denitrification phase, where under anaerobic conditions, um, we go from nitrate to nitrogen gas. Nitrous oxide is an intermediate product in that step. And some of this nitrous oxide is going to leak out before it is fully reduced to nitrogen gas. So we have a source of nit nitrous oxide when we have anaerobic or oxygen deficient conditions. We can also produce nitrous oxide in the nitrification process. Now it requires oxygen or the microbes require oxygen to go from ammonium to nitrate. Um, nitrous oxide in this case is not an intermediate, but it's a byproduct. And sometimes, especially where we're maybe at more marginal oxygen levels, um, we can get nitrous oxide leakage from here as well. So we have two places natural in the nitrogen cycle where nitrous oxide um, can be released. 
So a question we might ask is why do we want to, um, you know, why are we concerned about nitrous oxide in organic agriculture given all the other sources of greenhouse gases? Because after all, as we've shown, nitrous oxide is a small piece of the total emissions pie. In the United States, it's about 5%. It's dwarfed by what's going on with carbon dioxide and fossil fuels. And then, although agriculture is the main source of our nitrous oxide emissions, at this point, organic farming is a small piece of the agriculture pie. And further, the way that we want to practice organic farming is to have a tightly coupled nitrogen cycle which means that our availability of nitrogen is in sync with the plant demand and uptake for nitrogen. So we should have less reactive nitrogen in the system at any one time, and that should help reduce nitrous oxide emissions. Um, we feel that, one, it's important to understand all sources of emissions and how we might mitigate those. And also, I, I think, um, you know, anyone who has visited organic farms, who has farmed organically and visited other organic farms know that organic systems vary widely in nitrogen supply from soil and amendments. There are some that are deficient in nitrogen, some that are probably truly tightly coupled, um, others where there's obviously um, an excess of nitrogen there, the crops are really green, they're growing really well, but you say, I wonder how much um, nitrate is in that soil at this point. Um, also, we know that carbon stimulates microbial activity, and one of the things that we do in organic farming systems um, as we build organic matter, as we get more carbon, more active carbon in those systems, we do stimulate microbial activity. So the question is, can we, you know, are we having a situation where on some of these farms we may be enhancing denitrification? So this gives us an opportunity to compare among different organic farming systems um, to help us link. Um, our management with the things we're concerned about, yield and soil quality, but also link them into nitrous oxide emissions and soil biology. So that's our overall goal. What I'm going to do now is um, briefly go over some of the ex experiments that we have in the field and then some of the specific treatments within these experiments that we're using to study um, the nitrous oxide emissions. And here at Washington State University Puyallup, we have two um, experiments going on. We have what we call our long-term um, organic vegetable cropping systems experiment. This started back in 2003, so we are getting a certainly a maturing system at this point. And then we have um, a newer experiment um, in organic reduced tillage. We actually started the work in 2009, but the particular plots that we're on now we established in 2011 and plan to um, run those for a number of more years. Our long-term organic farming systems research, um, we've, had, we've had funding through the USDA, a number of different USDA programs, IFAPS, um, SARE, OREI. We've also had some state funding for this as well. And um, really, our, our, our main focus has been on nutrient management, soil quality, crop yield, and quality. Um, we have a lot of data on economics of crop production, some on weed ecology and management, not so much on the insect side of that. Of, of that. But the idea was to look at these some different organic farming systems and see how they performed with regard to as many of these, these factors as possible. And now we've also moved to look at um, nitrous oxide emissions as well. I'm just going to talk about some parts of this experiment because we have we have tillage, 
we have cover crops, we have amendments, and I'm just going to briefly mention the cover crops and the amendments. Um, <clears throat> We have two cover crop systems that are tilled every year. That's our traditional post-harvest. Uh, we use a rye, hairy vetch mix, and then we also have a relay planted legume. Um, this is maybe not quite truth in advertising. They don't always look this good, um, where we plant into the standing crop and then let it um, establish over the winter. And then we have a, a short-term pasture, and for a number of years now we've been running this pasture. Um, it's a grass clover pasture. We run it for two years in the pasture mode and during the summertime we raise sheep on the pasture for a briefer period during the summer. Um, we've had pastured poultry in the traveling cages. And since about 2005 um, the only inputs to this pasture have been nitrogen fixation through the legumes um, and the sheep obviously recycle that around in their manure. The chickens we do have to provide supplemental feed so there's some supplemental nutrients coming in there but it's basically a low input system compared with our cover crop systems that receive soil amendments every year, nitrogen and carbon so those are more high input systems. The amendments that we use, um, we have broiler litter that we, that we compost um, to make sure that we have a, a pathogen kill. And I call that our low C treatment. It's fairly rich in nitrogen. It's usually running up around three and a half, four percent nitrogen. Um, we add this at, we apply this at fairly modest rates. And then we have uh, an on-farm compost that we also make here on the farm. We use an aerated static pile for that um, and it's a mixture of um, dairy manure, a little bit of broiler litter. Um, we have um, bedding from animals that is that is pretty high in carbon. We have yard debris in it and some years we also have some fish waste incorporated in that. Um, altogether it is not as rich in nitrogen as what we find in the broiler litter, maybe around 2% nitrogen in that range. We apply it at a higher rate and our goal is to get equivalent available nitrogen from the two of them. But the mixed on farm compost is adding a lot more organic matter to the soil. And we've done over the years a whole suite of soil quality measurements and so we have a handle on how these different farming systems affect soil quality um, and basically with the, soil, with the high carbon soil amendment where we're adding more carbon to the system um, we see a lot of very short term changes in bulk density, infiltration, organic matter, some changes in enzyme activity. Um, it's interesting, um, some, of, some of the other ones, the differences between the cover crops. Um, we see some infiltration and compaction differences depending upon where we are in the cover crop cycle. Um, and so we've, we've seen changes occurring to the soil quality over time. And I think Doug and Anne Marie will talk about some more specific aspects of that um, on Thursday. So I won't go into much detail right now. And then the second experiment I mentioned um, deals with reduced tillage research, um, the holy grail of organic farming systems. And we are looking at um, termination of cover crops, leaving them on the surface as a mulch with the idea that we can at least delay the onset of weed germination, um, get our cash crops a little bit better established. Um, we still have a long way to go on that, but you can see some of the treatments that we have. We've been comparing um, flail, flail mowing over here that, that breaks the crop up to um, rolling. You know, the rolling looks very good right at this point, but we have to hit the maturity of the crop right. We have to pick the right crop to really be able to get a good um, kind of a, a good termination 
and a good mulch there for that system. But we can think of these as lower input systems. We have lower nitrogen inputs into these systems. Um, so these are ones that contrast with what we have in our, in our um, other organic systems experiment. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about our gas sampling methods and then in my last slide I will I will close with just some of the specific treatments that we're going to be that we're going to be or that we are um, evaluating now um, for nitrous oxide emissions and there's two basic methods for um, for measuring nitrous oxide emissions one is what's called chambers where you um, where you capture gas that's being emitted from the soil for a short period of time. You sample um, the, the, the gas levels at several time intervals and then you can calculate a flux from that. Um, this, this is a scale that's suitable to work in kind of small to medium plot research. Um, some of the downsides of it is, is these are snapshots in time. So we may miss flux events. And the way our experiment is designed, we know that we are not catching all of the flux, but we're trying to measure it at some key interesting times where we can compare among those treatments. Um, there's also some soil disturbance when the, when the bases of these pans are put into the ground, but we found that we can leave them there between tillage events, and so we minimize that disturbance. Um, another approach is the micrometeorological approach where you are measuring <coughs> really the bulk atmosphere um, over an area and measuring the emissions coming from that. You can do this on a field scale. You can do this continuously. Um, some downsides is one, this is very expensive. Two, it doesn't work on small research plots. You really need some pretty large areas to be able to make comparisons. And then the data is challenging to interpret because you're getting, um, you're not enclosed like in a chamber. You're getting input from a, from a lot of different places and to be able to interpret that. Um, so the chambers approach is conceptually a whole lot simpler and in practice it's a whole lot simpler to do. Um, we lose some of what we can get from the micrometeorological approach, but the different approaches are really, really fit best with different types of research. There's different types of chambers that folks use, and in, and in fact, um, we've been involved with projects using different types of chambers, you know, over the course of the last few years, and, and we've chosen these, um, these middle-sized chambers here that are used, um, these are restaurant steam table pans that have been adapted for use as chambers. Um, the small ones, one disadvantage is you're not collecting from a very big area of soil, so you worry about variability. Um, Large chambers like the ones on the right hand side, um, we are collecting from a lot larger area, so maybe less issues with localized variability. But these are pretty awkward to use, we've found, and so there's uh, you know, a greater opportunity for error during the sampling, a greater opportunity for disturbance, and, and we think potentially, we, we don't know if there's a greater opportunity for kind of loss from these or not. So we've, we've opted for the middle-sized pans. Um, the lid is made from one pan covered with insulation, and then it has a sampling port on it where we can withdraw um, gases at specific time intervals, and we're measuring ours for nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. Um, these are, when it comes time to make measurements, these are clipped onto a base, and the base is simply um, another steam pan with the bottom cut out of it, and we push this into the ground, and then we leave it there between tillage events. Um, we sample at 
what we consider to be key points throughout the year um, before and after amendment application and in our tilled plots that includes tillage so we have a before sample we then apply amendments we then till the amendments in and then over the next two weeks um, we sample at intervals um, to see um, the flux of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide from the soil um, another key event in our environment is irrigation we're in a dry summer environment and so the kind of the main input of moisture is through irrigation um, we're using drip irrigation systems so um, you know before and, and then after an irrigation event we also measure the gas fluxes and then another one there's quite a bit of data that says that freeze thaw events can be significant for release of nitrous oxide and so we do a couple of freeze thaw events each winter um, here in western Washington it's not particularly cold winters if we get a freeze and then it thaws um, say three or four days later that's a pretty good freeze thaw event for us so those that's the type of sampling that we're doing that's basically the information that I have to cover today so it's a somewhat short webinar I'm just looking at my time there and um, please you know tune in on Thursday to hear more about these experiments more about the biology and unmuted or about some of our preliminary emissions data and um, when we have questions um, both Doug and Anne Marie are online and there's some that they may want to answer as well um, Alice, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and um, I don't know how you want to kind of carry on at this point. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, we're about to begin the question and answer um, period, so um, we're going to have Craig and then Anne-Marie um, Fortuna and Doug Collins can both unmute their microphones, and that way... Um, everyone can chime in with the answers. So for anyone who missed the beginning of the presentation, um, you can use the question box on your screen to type in a question and hit return. And if you don't see the question box, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question to open it up. Um, so um, moving on here, we do have some questions coming in. Um, here's one. Um, how much uniformity is there regarding the limits that are considered crucial for nitrous oxide concentrations? Um, I, I, I might need a little bit, um, kind of a little bit more clarification on that. Is, is, is this kind of the, how much is being released from an agricultural field or, or, or what we're looking at on a, on a global scale? Okay. If, um, the person who submitted that question wants to just, um, add a little more to that, um, when, when, uh, she does that, we'll... We'll read that out. Um, so um, on the um, experiment that you did comparing um, the different inputs, um, not the um, very low input system, but the one before that, um, we had someone wanting to know um, whether you could um, manage it just on legumes and on farm composting, um, so from nothing else off the farm. Um. You know, I, I would say in the in the long run, um, we probably couldn't. You know, the way ours is set up, we probably couldn't manage it from off the farm. And the on-farm composting, um, maybe a little bit of truth in advertising, is we compost on-farm, but we are opportunists, and we have these amendments on the farm to serve some other purposes. So the the dairy manure is not from our own cows, and the um, and the broiler manure is is not from our own chicken. So they're actually off farm inputs that we make the compost on farm. So we are importing those inputs. Probably the closest thing that we have to um, a closed system would be our our pasture plots, and even that we're bringing in um, we're bringing in the chicken feed. You know, we could grow our own chicken feed, but that would be on additional land. And then the question is kind of what are the inputs for growing that? 
and and I, I I did forget I had one last slide that that shows the specific treatments that we're comparing. So we do have the compost, the broiler litter, the pasture, which is our our low input system there, and then our organic reduced tillage where we have a mulched one and our tilled control there that are also moderately low input systems. Okay, um, we had some clarification on the question about how much uniformity is there regarding the limits that are considered crucial for nitrous oxide concentrations, and um, the person was referring to IPCC goals. I'm not sure what that stands for. Oh, but... oh, okay, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on that, but I, I probably know just enough to be dangerous is, um, is, is the IPCC you know, has looked at a lot of nitrous oxide emission work and kind of gotten some, um, you know, and I, I forget what their numbers are, if it's about a percent or, 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 or somewhere in that range or maybe a little less than that of, of how much nitrous oxide emission we would expect we would expect to have, um, you know, versus the versus the inputs, and and I, I think there's, you know, there's there's two issues there. One is how much flexibility do we have in our management to say reduce that percentage of emissions, and then the other is how much flexibility do we have to manage our input so there's just less reactive nitrogen there um, in in total, and my feeling is we probably have more f flexibility, more kind of freeboard in managing those in those um, inputs more efficiently. Okay, um, we're getting a number of questions about um, just kind of the practical um, ways of managing the um, chambers that you have. Um, so um, one question is, um, how long after the amendment application and irrigation events do you um, continually or regularly monitor the greenhouse gases? Okay, for the for the um, the amendment and, and tillage effects, we try to get our first measurement, you know, as 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 quickly after the tillage passes through as we can. And then we go for two weeks after that and, and we'll go like day zero day one, day two, day three, day seven, and then not again till about day 14 is, is what that's looked at. And the irrigation events, um, I'm trying to remember right now, I think we continue for about a week after that. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, also, um, what is the minimum amount of rainfall that requires gas sampling? Um, this last year we did not sample rainfall events. Um, I think it's something that is that is pretty valuable to do um, and I don't have a good number for you on that. It's something that I have not looked up. I don't know Anne Marie if, if you have sure. any if you have any um, something to add to that or Doug. Yeah, I think uh, as unlike the Midwest, uh, the Pacific Northwest, most of the precipitation is occurring between the fall and the spring. So if I re remember, uh, we had fairly minimal rain, which is why we were irrigating. And even, you know, small rainfall events will induce nitrous oxide emissions. So uh, there's two approaches that you can take, or actually three. One would be that continuous monitoring that Craig talked about where you're sorting out all the eddy covariance and things like that. And then if you're working with the static chambers, uh, some people take the approach of sampling continuously in increments that are every couple of weeks or a week. And then other individuals have taken the approach to do it during events. And so we chose to try to get not every single bit of the emissions. Um, and so the chamber approach, you would always have to try to take the major fluxes and the major events as opposed to trying to monitor everything, which you would do in a continuous ring down system or in one of those weather stations that are connected to the monitoring. Um, so either approach on the average is supposed to give you approximately the same um, average nitrous oxide emissions. Now, the people that are um, just try to 
uh, measure nitrous oxide very accurately that are methodology-based people will tell you that this approach doesn't provide the best, the perfect estimate. But um, our approach is to get an idea of which systems have the most emissions and which events, both weather, climatic, and um, management operations are going to either reduce or induce the emissions. And then based on that, we're trying to give recommendations to growers. And as far as to the scientific community, there's so little information on these systems um, that a comparison between each of these managements is a value even if the absolute number that we're getting is not perfect. And um, some of the climate change experts use data that is also um, average. So I hope that makes sense. So basically our approach um, would be to find where the, the max fluxes are and how the climate interacts with that and the management practices. And this particular field plots for that climate, uh, the weather conditions are such that the irrigation would typically be the events that we would be focusing on rather than the rainfall. But rainfall, um, especially when it's been dry for quite a while, even a few millimeters or less, could spike nitrous oxide. But what you're trying to measure is um, the the major events to get an average and to compare across each of those managements. Right, right. Yeah, we're not trying to create a balance sheet here. We're just trying to do some comparisons at some at some specific points in time. And so we're not we're not catching everything and we've chosen to focus on the irrigation, which are a little bit more reliable than the rainfall events. And I believe I, I think it would be appropriate to say, Craig, that uh, given the dry climate during that time of year, that the irrigation would, in most instances, spark more emissions than the rainfall events, given the amount of uh, events that, the amount of times we irrigate in a growing season. Right. We have two other sites. I mean, one is a, a field site at Purdue that's in the Midwest, and one of the things that we're comparing across the two sites is the rainfall pattern. So uh, Purdue, unlike Washington State, would get the bulk of the rain in the summer. So uh, the rainfall events in the non-irrigated system uh, in vegetable crops as well would definitely be a focus that they would have. And we'll have webinars from each of the sites, and then we have data from North Dakota as well. Okay. Um, so, um, have you seen more um, nitrous oxide nitrous oxide emissions from more legume crops in rotations, as stated in, um, as I guess it says something like, as stated in IPCC indicated? I'm not sure what. Um, that means, but maybe you understand what he means. Um, it may be early, too early to ask this question, but I'm curious because I didn't see that trend in my research in the Central High Plains. Okay, yeah, it's. I, I guess it's it's too early to ask for us, and actually, it will probably always be too early because we we have more an amendment than a cover crop focus. Really, um, there's a little bit of what I would say if if we were to for the cover crops, it's a it would be kind of an apples and oranges comparison. Um, the slide on there now, you know, that's a grain cover crop. Our pasture does have <clears throat> a lot more legume in it, and they're both low input systems, but they're managed so differently that I would still be concerned about trying to um, compute any differences to cover crops. And actually, because these are two different experiments, um, the comparisons that we would make would be would be qualitative only. Can I add to Craig and maybe Doug has something to say because this is getting more towards the area that he's working on. Doug, did, do you want to say anything before I jump in? Uh, no, I think Craig covered it. That we're focusing mostly on the amendments with this in terms of what's different about the systems. Um, you know, in the long-term organic farming systems, the, the big difference there <clears throat> is the amendment application. And then uh, the reduced tillage, the big difference is the tillage that occurs in one versus in the other. 
and then the cover crops are are different, but they're very the other differences are probably larger in the systems. So we did have an experiment, and this was uh, part of a field experiment that we included an incubation with, where we applied uh, the legume and rye cover crop. It was a mixed cover crop. And we looked at nitrogen cycling, and we found within this closed experiment that we got quite a lot of ammonia volatilization, and that depending on the nitrogen content of the two materials together, that we got more or less nitrous oxide, and that was related largely, I think, to the carbon to nitrogen ratio and how much nitrogen that we got out. And we had quite a bit of variability between how much vetch versus rye we got each year depending on the climate. So I think the answer to that question is more uh, what is your total biomass, what's the C to N ratio of both of those materials, and then you have to factor in the climatic conditions of that year as well. And so I think uh, legumes can potentially, like any nitrogen source, spark nitrous oxide, and the fact that cover crops contain carbon, which is needed for the nitrifier communities because they use the nitrogen and the carbon, um, you know, has to is is the part of the equation. So, if you manage the timing of the kill and the climatic conditions are right, such that the ratio of those inputs um, doesn't allow for quick mineralization uh, without a plant there, then you can use your cover crops to help manage the nitrogen cycling and not completely mitigate nitrous oxide, but reduce the potential in the system for that. And I would say that most of these systems are limited in, limited in nitrogen. Um, the first part of uh, the whole long-term organic vegetable cropping systems project focused on nitrogen mineralization and nitrogen use efficiency and uptake because we're limited. And so that is an advantage on the nitrous oxide emissions side because um, just like Craig said, your, um, your limited nitrogen works um, to reduce the potential for the trace gases. So that's a value added for the organic growers and it's something that um, is the opposite side of the coin. You know, it's a struggle to get N in the system, but at least because there's not a lot of reactive nitrogen, uh, we believe there's the potential for a reduction, at least in that trace gas, and that's a value added to the product to the grower and a benefit to the public. Okay, thank you. Um, from your research, um, can you conjecture um, about whether organic systems are less N2O producing the non-organic system? You know, from our research, um, we, I don't feel like we have enough data yet. And I think one of the, you know, one of the key things is going to be <clears throat> how much reactive nitrogen do we have in that system and how close, how tightly coupled is it? And I think some of our systems like the pasture and our, and our reduced tillage are going to be quite tightly coupled, but maybe to the point of being nitrogen deficient. And the other systems, you know, based on some of the um, soil nitrate levels that we've seen in past years um, are not so well coupled. And again, we don't have a direct comparison with a conventional system, so that's going to be hard to, you know, hard to say directly. But um, you know, we're, we're going to be seeing higher, you know, higher emissions from those. Okay. So, um, okay, go ahead. I, um, I was just going to say that uh, one of the things that has been uh, theorized in a few articles in the literature, and I agree with Craig, um, this was just our first year, so we can't really say a whole lot, is that organic systems can influence the activity and community structures of denitrifiers in a way that leads to um, greater production of elemental nitrogen, which is the end product of the complete denitrification process, as opposed to um, producing more nitrous oxide. So um, in theory, because the reactive nitrogen is limited, it may be that we get less denitrification, but 
there's also this premise um, that we, we can test, at least in the laboratory, that when we get denitrification, do the con are the conditions there to lead to the production of elemental nitrogen as opposed to a partial uh, denitrification process where we get a lot out as nitrous oxide. And that those factors are things like oxygen concentrations, uh, available carbon, and then uh, nitrate. And so those balance, those three element, elemental um, environmental factors balanced could in theory lead to um, a end product of uh, nitrous oxide, which is 78% of the atmosphere and reduce uh, potential for the uh, trace gas nitrous oxide. So we'll see. Okay, um, we had a question about how you manage the gas, um, the chambers when you have the tillage and irrigation events going on. Do you keep them intact or what do you do with them? We, when, when the, when we're actually tilling, we have to obviously remove the bases. Um, and then we put them back in after tillage and we leave them there until the next, you know, until the next tillage event when we have to disturb things again. So um, we ha try to have those bases set so that you know the, the irrigation, the drip irrigation lines are going to go over them and there's going to be a you know kind of our, our, our drip pattern um, within that base. For the pastures, we use overhead irrigation there, so so they all they all get overhead irrigated. Okay. Um, currently, what is the best method to control for field scale variability in soil types and properties and topography? It sounds like a Doug question to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can uh, I can try to address that. Um, you know, for the long-term organic farming systems experiment, we came in and looked at inherent um, variability kind of after the fact, after the experiment was set up. And, you know, I think we had a, a hint that there was some inherent variability. So the experiment is a, is a blocked experiment, and so blocking is a great way, um, blocked and replicated, so blocking is a great way to account for variability. Um, what we found when we came and looked at um, the inherent variability after the fact in the systems experiment was that within blocks there was quite a bit of variability <clears throat> in soil texture. So for example, sand content uh, rain, in the worst example, sand content ranged from I think 30% to over 60% within one block. So that's uh, not a great situation because that means that one of your treatments, you know, is, is in a much different uh, soil type than another within the same block. So usually the concept of blocking is that you're grouping where if there are changes, those, those changes are, are going to be accounted for by blocking. So um, we took that, that knowledge and really applied it um, uh, full scale with the, uh, before we put in the experiment. So we did um, what's called ad hoc power analysis um, to try to group blocks in the reduced tillage experiment based on the parameters that we were most interested in potentially seeing changing within that experiment. So we did, um, we mapped the field before putting in the experiment, um, looking at below ground variability in um, organic matter and weed seed bank density, because those were the two things that we were most interested in. And then we were able to group our treatments uh, or to, to group our blocks and then randomize within those blocks based on what we felt would give us the most statistical power to see differences in organic matter and weed seed bank um, over the course of the experiment. And um, just, you know, the, it was a very valuable exercise because the way we sort of evaluated it was doing blocks that just kind of ran from east to west, which is sort of the first, when we first laid it out, we thought, oh, this is how we would might do it. And then um, we found, you know, doing the power analysis, like, uh, 90, 99 percent increase in efficiency by by doing it the way we ended up doing it. So that's called ad hoc power analysis. Basically, you have to go in and do some sort of mapping of the soil variability before you put your uh, experiment in place. And that's more difficult with soil than it is for other things. Other things that you might be taking statistical measures on because you have to actually do some do some assessment beforehand. 
Yeah, and in our in our systems experiment where Doug was mentioning that variability, I, I should describe the site a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me, is we're <coughs> is is we're on. <coughs> well, I lost my voice. Is we're on alluvial soils, and we have just some subtle differences in topography. A lot of um, fine sands and and coarse silts. And so there are a few areas where um, the coarse silts dominate instead of the fine sands, and that's where we see in this one particular rep, um, you know, those rather large differences. And and that rep has probably been our it's been our most variable rep as well. So it it really came home to roost on us. And then um, one other thing that would that we can sort of monitor is how much variability is there within a single plot. And so we have um, three subsamples um, within each plot, and then we have you know four replications. So there's a total of 12 measurements being taken um, with the reduced tillage. We get gets further complicated because we have different zones within that reduced tillage experiment, which you might have gotten a little bit of feel for. Um, since we're using drip irrigation, you've, you, we basically have the plant zone and then everything else. So one of the concepts we're looking at with reduced tillage is we're still disturbing, we're still disturbing the soil, but um, either in one of our treatments we're disturbing it in about a um, two to four inch wide swath, and then in another one, or strip tilling, we're disturbing about eight inch wide swath, but then we're not disturbing the rest. So then we're creating even more, you know, variability over the landscape. So we're trying to account for the the differences between those two zones as well. Um, so we end up with two sub we basically end up with two subsamples in that dis disturbed zone and then one su one subsample outside of that zone. Um, and that's just what we can account what we can do with the manpower, I guess. Go ahead, Emery. Sure. So when um, just to clarify for the audience and to when you can clarify what I'm saying. Um, in the uh, systems plots, the three sub samples within each of the four field plot replicates is for the gases. And then for soils, we do um, similar to soil, traditional soil nitrate uh, sampling where we do uh, a randomized um, Coring, sampling. Yeah. yeah, and then with the plants, um, it's, uh, it's more like a traditional um, biomass measurement either you're you're doing a meter squared transect and you're throwing the squares out randomly um, or with the um, with the yield uh, the har the traditional the whole, harvest rows. Yeah, whole pot. no that's right yeah I guess okay. I was trying to address the, the fact with the chambers and and I think Craig Craig had a slide that showed you know the three different sizes of chambers so with those chambers you're trying to account for soil variability and also have replications and it's always just a trade-off and, and um, you know the, the chamber we've chosen those the small chambers he showed that was the original yes. one that that we use the one on the left there and there was a lot of variability between you know two chambers within the same plot and I think we've seen less variability with these um, the ones in the middle the larger the medium size one in this slide um, someone wants to know whether you have any type of PowerPoint available or any kind of instructions on how to set up um, these uh, chambers to how to prepare and install them. Anyway, I don't know if you do, but uh, you know, you know we to, yeah. yeah we don't have one. Um, you know, it, it's something that we could develop, but basically. Our, the way that we made these is very similar to um, to, to the group in, in in Minnesota, and I'm trying to Very remember sick. if if they had if they had a PowerPoint or a or a YouTube on these or or not. Do you remember Anne Marie? Yeah, it's we use the GraceNet protocol, and then uh, Rodney. Uh, I am probably going to mispronounce his name. I think it's uh, Ventura. Uh, we emailed him to verify some of the specs. We had talked about, and I think we will come up with a set of standard protocols uh, for a lot of this, of these uh, sampling schemes. Uh, we, the Puyallup site actually has their own website and there is data on that and uh, there was 
some apprehension in going from the website that's already up there onto something on e-organic, but um, is it safe to say, Craig, that at some point we will have protocols? I certainly can give you guys the molecular ones to yeah, post. Yeah, it might be a great video, too. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think it could video. be a great video. Yeah, we have the just, still shots, yeah. Just the sampling, and we can even, you know, we, we have the still shots, and even that can be turned into, you know, a, a video or or um, what do I want to say? Embedded in, mm -hmm. into a video, and mm -hmm. and for some reason I couldn't find my stills, but I think you have the Anne Marie from yes, the day we, the day we were building them, and and we got all those photos. Yeah, and I I think um, I I know I definitely have quite a few, and I I thought Doug might have taken a couple when he was doing his ergo measurements as well. So we, we could put something together and it, Alice could help us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll talk yeah. about that afterwards. Um, but we did get a comment. <laughs> we did get a comment um, and um, from a, another um, listener who said the researcher um, you were talking about is named um, Rodney Venturea. Um, yeah. And um, it, it's um, the USDA GraceNet um, with the Grace capitalized um, net trace gas protocol and so they recommend um, contacting Venturea or Tim Perkin from GraceNet and they are yes. very helpful with sending documents with instructions for chamber fabrication so thank you for that comment um, okay and, and so these are basically their chambers okay okay great thank you um, okay so to switch gears here um, someone wanted to know whether there are if you know anything about hydroponics um, N2O emissions, so um, nitrous oxide emissions, so um, do you have any comments about that? I I don't have any comments. I haven't looked into hydroponics at all. You know, it is an interesting question. Obviously, you know, you need to have oxygenated water, which is going to limit any denitrification step, and I don't even know in hydroponics what source of nitrogen you are providing and whether you know you don't have the soil organisms there so I don't I don't know I'm going to shut up and see if <laughs> anyone else has any comments well, I guess the same principles apply it would depend on how much free nitrate you have and um versus you know the ammonium um I would guess in hydroponics you'd be constantly circulating so oxygen wouldn't be an issue and then because most of the denitrifiers need carbon uh, whether there's a carbon source so it would really depend on your setup um, and it's definitely not my area though I know a lot of people in organics do use hydroponics. Um, Doug? No I haven't, I have nothing more to add, I haven't really okay. looked into okay. that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for attempting the question there. Um, okay, so um, here's a question about what the risk of um, nitrous oxide emissions is from wastewater applied with flood, flood irrigation. Wastewater applied with flood irrigation. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it sounds like there's the opportunity to go anaerobic um, or, or at least low oxygen levels. You know, if you're and, and to produce and the wastewater will not have any nitrate in it. It'll have ammonium in it. So and if there's little oxygen, you won't get much nitrification, so you won't get much denitrification. So probably your main source of nitrous oxide emissions would be on the on the nitrification side. If you have enough oxygen to do a little nitrification, um, you can get some nitrous oxide losses there. But you know, my gut feeling is there's a potential for significant enough losses that it's something that would be worth looking at. We did a project with remember um, Olivia Saunders' project with the the waste uh, where we land applied it, and we got a lot more. No surprise, uh, ammonia volatilization. I mean, it depends on the pH in part, but there was also a decent amount of nitrous oxide. I think because there's still, like you said, Craig, enough uh, nitrogen, I mean enough uh, oxygen that you can get some nitrification and then possibly denitrification. So I, I think um, it would be high for 
reactive nitrogen losses, and then of course nitrate leaching potentially if you're getting flow. I mean, if it's saturated and you've got a water table coming up, you wouldn't get uh, the nitrate leaching because you wouldn't have flow downward so much, but I would say reactive end losses would be high. Okay, um, here's a question about how can farmers correct an unbalance between um, phosphorus and nitrogen without having excessive phosphorus? I think um, this is in the context of using organic amendments. Um, Craig, you're okay. You're yeah, I could, I could give a first, stuff. I could give a first shot at that, and and I don't know if Doug will want to chime in or not, but you know this this is one of the challenges that we face um, in organic farming systems, especially where we are bringing in amendments, say that are animal waste based, because they are rich in phosphorus compared with nitrogen. So if you start out with a soil that's phosphorus deficient, um, you know there's nothing better than say broiler litter or something like that <coughs> to bring up those <coughs> those phosphorus levels um, and also be supplying nitrogen. But after repeated applications, you will get that phosphorus up to high levels, and you don't need any more. <coughs> And so why should we care if you're, let's say you're getting the broiler litter for the nitrogen and you're getting this, you know, the phosphorus is coming along from the, for the ride. At first it helps you and then it doesn't help you. Well, the reason that we care is that phosphorus is a potential water contaminant if we're getting um, runoff erosion into bodies of surface water then that phosphorus becomes a contaminant. And so we look at overall phosphorus loading. And I would say, you know, if, if your soil gets up to excessive levels of phosphorus, the NRCS has something called the phosphorus index. You know, it's something that we could look at to say, okay, here's a high risk field. And at that point, you know, my feeling is, is we need to go to a more legume based approach um, and perhaps supplemented with you know some of the expensive nitrogen rich fertilizers you know whether it's a fish meal or a feather meal or something like that where we're adding relatively little phosphorus at that point okay thank you um i guess we have one more question here um and i guess i think you mentioned this earlier but if you could just um if you did um just repeat what the time gap is between the irrigation and the measurement of nitrous oxide in the experiment and we want to know that again Okay, we irrigate, and the first measurement is on is on day zero, so it would be right after the irrigation, and then we go day one, day two, and then a couple more days o over a week long period, and we haven't extended that further like we do with our initial application, uh, initial application of amendments. Okay, great. Well, um, that was pretty much all the questions there. And um, yeah, it was kind of nice. We had a shorter presentation, but more time for the discussion. Um, but now um, we are running out of time. So I'd like to thank everyone for your questions and um, for joining us here today. And mention once again that you can find um, our many other upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics at the link on your screen. And this webinar is being recorded. And so we're going to try and get this recording up as fast as possible for those who missed today's live presentation. Um, we heard from a couple people that also want to attend Thursday so they wanted to listen to this one first. Um, and um, we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey that you'll receive in an email later today. So thank you very much, Craig, as well as Doug and Anne-Marie. And um, thanks for joining us online today. And um, please do join us again on Thursday. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Craig. That was, that was really good. <laughs>